words to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the Hey, good morning, Hillcrest. Welcome to another week online. We are in the midst of a vision series right now. My name is David, and this is Aaron, our kids director. 
And if you joined us last week on the lawn at 9 a.m., it was a blast to be back for the first time in that space and community. And if you're now joining us online or are continuing online, welcome. We are so glad you're here with us. And, and right in the middle of this vision series, we are looking forward to just unpacking the three lifestyles that we hope we embody here at Hillcrest for the days to come, that we want to be people that follow Jesus, build community, and seek transformation of our homes, neighborhoods, and world. And we were out on the lawn at 9 a.m., because when we're back here inside of our building on September 20th, we will also be launching for service at 9 a.m. and at 1045. We're going to be pushing our two services back 30 minutes for two primary reasons. One, it felt like the services didn't reflect a multi-generational feel. And it felt like one service was more unbalanced than the other. So to create a more multi-generational feel in both services... And to have a more balanced feel in both services, we're going to push it back 30 minutes. And we're going to try and have kids at both, but Aaron's going to share some of those details of what it looks like as we get back together with our kids. So, so Aaron, what does it look like when we regather with our kids' ministry? Yeah, so we have an exciting Sunday planned on Sunday, September 20th. We can't wait to see the kids return to once again pour into their lives. And um, the, th the fun and the best part of kids' ministry is teaching them and showing them who Jesus is and watching them understand that more fully. So it's definitely a wonderful place to be. So as David said, we are going to only be able, we're going to start with a 9 a.m. service um, because we're confident that we can fill that with adequate volunteers to make sure that the kids are very well taken care of, stay safe. And ideally, we'll be able to open a second service. So um, that will be contingent on, you know, if we see that we have uh, enough volunteers. And so if you ever have this heart, share this vision. Um, we would love to have you join the team to make that um, even more possible to happen. So, but we're all going to be down at the activity center. We have a plan where the kids will be separated by families and they'll be joined together with table leaders and we're so excited. So um, a more detailed email will come out to you with those details so you know exactly what to expect. But that's a little sneak peek. So we're looking forward, as Aaron said, to have kids ministry fully at 9 a.m., and we would love to see that fully at both of our services when we regather. And you also have a great building community opportunity for us coming up on the 27th. Why don't you share a little bit of that with us? Yeah, so the Hillcrest kids team and I are working towards some family nights for this year, and those are just aimed at getting families together to have a really good time and also to provide them an opportunity to bring friends and neighbors to meet other people from Hillcrest and just to see what this um, life is that we're living. So on Sunday, September 27th, we are going to be having a um, an actual a lunch and game day. Um, so yeah, so we're excited for a drive-through meal and then um, picnic on the lawn and some bingo to follow. So it'll be super fun. So be looking for more details on that event. Well, as we continue our service, we're going to begin by hearing from Aaron and Joe Wilder as, as they reflect a little bit of what God has been doing in their heart over COVID and, and quarantine over the past few months, and also about their desire to be back in community and sharing life with those around them. So, so will you welcome them with me? And continuing our service, we get to, uh, to see Joe and Aaron Wilder. And, and uh, just like many of you, God's been doing some things during COVID in your life during this quarantine. Um, for you guys, what's this quarantine been like? Well, uh, I, I really thought quarantine wouldn't affect me. I've, I've worked from home uh, since 2015, so working from home was no big deal. Now, my wife got to work from home, but we're still working. Uh, you know, the garden and the yard are still growing. Got to spend a little more time with, with family, but uh, overall, I, I, I really thought it would have no effect on me. I was wrong. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm a very high energy person, but I am an introvert and I do get my energy from being alone. So I really figured that being alone for more of the time or, ha or having fewer social contacts wasn't going to be a big deal. My primary hobby is riding horses. That's a very solitary activity and I could still do that. So I thought I was all set. It wasn't until we had the opportunity to get together with our life group over Memorial Day weekend for a socially distanced bonfire um, that I really realized how much I was missing community and specifically the community that we found here at Hillcrest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The uh, 
prior to COVID, uh, I've been involved with men's ministry a, a lot. We've had breakfasts and, and just working with Fred and the team there has been great, but it really slowed down. Now, now Fred's on sabbatical and, and being in touch with those, those Hillcrest guys, uh, I didn't realize it was missing. Uh, kind of impromptu, we, we went to the park just kind of just to see some friends from church and, and that fellowship was, was so great after, it, it, as a guy at Hillcrest, if, if you haven't uh, been around the other Hillcrest guys, haven't thought about, you know, life keeps going, but, but those connections and living that life together, building our community are, are really important. The men's ministry team, next Saturday, coming right up, we're going to have a wild game feed out in the parking lot here. Venison, pheasant, bison, whatever you can come up with. And uh, we look forward to joining you, you joining us just to reestablish those connections. I, I think if, if you come on out, you won't, you, when, when you go home, you'll realize how much that community really means to us. And so you might be feeling the same way, that part of what it looks like to be a part of a local church family, we are following Jesus and we are building community. And so you can click the link for the fall booklet and all the activities this Saturday, this men's wild game feed to just be together and what it looks like to connect in community. And as we pull apart the sermon of the day, just hearing from the author of Hebrews and from Jesus, the great value of what it truly means to be in community together. So pray with me as we enter into the service together. God, you're so good. Thank you for what you've, you've been doing in the Wilder home uh, during this time uh, in our lives as we seek to chase after you, but we've been missing what it looks like to, to be building community. And so may we, may we seek that out a little bit more and, and remember why being together is so valuable. Uh, thank you, Jesus, for your glory, we pray. Amen.
Man, it is, it is us continuing in this vision series, and we are hard to believe. Week three of our vision series, we got to look back at God's faithfulness to Hillcrest a couple weeks ago. Last week, we began unpacking one of the three lifestyles that we want to embody here at Hillcrest. That at Hillcrest, we want to be people helping people find life with Jesus one life at a time. And, and we want to be incredibly thoughtful and aligned in how that gets expressed here at Hillcrest. We want to be a multi-generational community inspiring people towards a lifetime of following Jesus, building community, and seeking transformation of our homes, neighborhoods, and world. And so last week we explored in Luke 5 Jesus' radical call to what it means to follow him, that it's not about how smart we are. Instead, it says something incredible about him. Who does Jesus actually pick to join him in his revolution? It's not the uber achievers. It's not the theological aptitude that he judges us on. Instead, it's the deep humility and brokenness that we come to him just as we are and we recognize it's him who we want more of. But we don't stop there and do life alone all by ourselves. Jesus actually redefines what it looks like when a community of these people come together. And so during COVID, during this quarantine, it, it feels like it's provided us an opportunity to reflect on what the body is. During this quarantine, when, when we've been separated, it, it feels like it's provided an opportunity for us to reflect on, on truly what the church family is and what this thing called church does. And sometimes it feels like we just perceive church as a Sunday morning activity, uh, which is a singing and teaching event that we judge much like we would any other thing in this life. Like a movie, we go home and we say, man, did I like that? Ah, the singing was good today, but man, that preacher that kind of has that swoop in his hair, I'm just not sure about that kid yet. And we judge church just like we would a movie or any other activity with our rugged individualism and consumer mentality. And it feels like COVID has provided an opportunity for us to reflect on what it truly means. The author of Hebrews says this in chapter 10, 25. He speaks to not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, sometimes it feels that's interpreted as the Sunday morning gathering, and, and we would assume then, well, because the Sunday morning gathering hasn't been happening, we've been doing more of this. W what's going on? What is the author of Hebrews actually calling us to? And, and as much as, as I believe, I'd like to believe that I'm an encouragement to you, I think he speaks more to what it means to encourage one another, not just on a Sunday, but actually Monday through Saturday. And, and so, Here's the question. Where do we do this encouragement? Where does this building of community take place? Uh, I see it in our women's ministry. I see it in our men's ministry that you just heard from Joe. Uh, I see it in organic relationships formed through this body, taking someone out to coffee, doing play dates together, having people over for dinner. And, and we're going to unpack a little bit more about what life groups can look like around here. But where does this encouragement take place? Sunday, no doubt, is a part of it. But I think as we go through it, it's so much more than that of what it truly means to build community. And the author of Hebrews and Jesus is going to do something radical this morning. They're going to redefine the primary place we seek this community. And we're going to see it because of the way Jesus purchased eternal life for us. He calls us into a radical, radical way of living. And so let me read the text. I'll pray for us, and then we will jump in to what God has for us in this part to this building of community, not just following Jesus in isolation, but building community. Here's what the author of Hebrews says. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope 
without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, not exclusively on Sunday, but actually in encouragement Monday to Saturday as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. We're going to press into Jesus redefining uh, this family, this community, and, and we're going to see him invite us to expand our understanding, our experience, and our expression of what the significance of Jesus' sacrifice is that leads us to meet together. So pray with me as we jump in this morning. God, you're so good. COVID, quarantine, being pressed away from community. Uh, we, we long to be in relationship with one another and we long to be in relationship with you. So meet us this morning as, as we dive in to a fuller understanding of what it means to build community together. For your glory we pray. Amen. Amen. So, so I want to start with the words of Jesus. And I think Jesus does something radical. We saw in Luke 5 last week of following him. He invites us into life with him. But what is that that he's inviting us into? I think Jesus begins redefining what our primary community is. Because in ancient society, in this first century Jewish culture, they have a high view of a group society. And sometimes it's hard for us to hear the words of Jesus from our modern day Western uh, American individualistic society lens. It's hard for us to see the weight of what Jesus is actually doing. Because because of the group, in the group society, I mean, if you've ever seen Fiddler on the Roof, right? If I were a rich, but there's another one. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. I mean, in this group society, it's not like the Disney mentality where you can just go and make your dreams come true and whatever you want to happen is going to happen and it's up to you. Instead, in a group society, a lot is defined by the group. A lot is defined on who you marry and your social status by the group and where you fit in this group. And this is the society Jesus is entering into, this first century patriarchal society. And, and, and we read a lot of Paul's letters. When he says you, we often sometimes read it as you singular, as the individual that Paul is writing to. Those are often plural yous that Paul's writing to a community. And so it's not just you and Jesus, but it's actually you and the community of those following Jesus. And, and these words strike us, I think, as heavy. How much more to a group society that's finding their primary identity, yes, in Yahweh, but also to their kinship group, to their community and their family. Here's what Jesus says in Luke 8. Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and my brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. And so what's Jesus doing in this moment? He's redefining the most important group in their life, namely their kinship group. That it's no longer your biological mother and your brothers who are the most important identity marker in your life. But he's now moving it to something other, namely our connection to his father. He continues on, Luke 11, I found this fascinating. As he said these things, this is Luke 11, 27 to 28. And I'm just going to read a few verses as we try and get a glimpse of Jesus redefining what it means to belong to this family. And he said these things, he was praying, he was preaching, Luke eleven twenty seven. 27, and as he said these things, a woman of the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. And a typical Jewish response would have been, yes, amen, hallelujah, absolutely, bless my mother. Instead, Jesus responds with these words, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Now, now if, you come, if you come from a great family, you might not hear these words as anything and, and, and you might say, but that's great, but I actually have a great family. 
And and I'm thankful for that. But what it feels like is that is increasingly not the norm and the normative in our world. Instead, it feels like that's the exception, not the rule. And Jesus begins reshaping this definition that my family doesn't define me. That Jesus is now redefining my most important family, and it's not this immediate kinship. And I want to read a verse from John chapter 1 that is incredibly familiar. And yet when we begin framing it with this lens of this group society rather than our individualistic society, Jesus is creating this radical new family. John says this in John chapter 1. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And we know this, right? We hear that language that, yeah, David, I'm familiar with that. We become children of God. But then he says this, who were born not of blood, not from a bloodline or a genealogy is is what develops this kinship, nor the will of the flesh. This wasn't a human decision that, that bore this child relationship, nor the will of man nor the husband's will, nor the patriarchal decision of how the family should be lived, but rather, he gave the right to be children of God. It was God who entered in to this adoptive relationship that we receive by grace adoption into his family. And so God becomes our father through Jesus. And now, who are these knuckleheads sitting around us? They actually become my brothers and my sisters. And... And when we say that, I know where your mind may go. When I hear brothers and sisters, I think, man, I'm going out to another potluck. I mean, hey, we're going to have some fellowship with my brothers and my sisters. And yet, and yet this becomes the most radical redefinition of, of, of group life in the first century. Namely, it doesn't matter who you are who you've been, uh, what your family has done, what your name is, who your relatives are, what your social status is. All that identity has now been put together under one. That you are now sons or daughters of one father. Where your primary allegiance now is actually to these other disciples. And, and, And if you've been negatively impacted by your family, This feels so freeing. That that maybe divorce or abandonment or abuse has been your story. And those family ties uh, aren't positive. Instead, Jesus offers an opportunity to this new family. And and sometimes we see salvation pictured through adoption. I, I feel like there's three images that we see often in Scripture that salvation is this view of justification, that it's a courtroom imagery and we've been justified by the righteous judge. Or, or sometimes uh, Paul pictures it as a slave market and, and now we've been ransomed and, and we've been ransomed and set free in Christ and we are free in him. I think this third imagery that, that, that Paul and Jesus speaks to is this image of family. And that we've been adopted into this family. And so here's the implications. And one more text and then we're going to head to Hebrews 10. But I want you to hear just how powerful this family imagery is. Paul writes to a guy named Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, he says this to a young pastor trying to figure out life. And Paul says this. Because this church now is primarily known as family. He says to Timothy, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men, encourage them as brothers. Older women as mothers. And younger women as sisters. All of this impurity. That we begin seeing this imagery of what it means to be a family now with one father. But here's the challenge to me. Who looks at church like this? It often feels that we view church 
in the same way we do as any other activity, that it's just another singing and teaching event, and we go home, and, and the first words aren't, how was Jesus glorified by that? But instead, we sit there and we evaluate it just like we would a movie or any other activity in life. Did I like it? Did it meet my needs? And maybe I'll come back. And if I enjoyed it, I might tip a little, and you might see me next week. Instead, Jesus is redefining what this view of church can be. And instead, we're actually committing to a body of believers and the church becomes this family. And this image calls into question our individualism and American culture because it feels like one of the reasons the American church is dying is because, is because it seems to be that we're doing it more for me potentially rather than him that we're not as enthralled in him and, and, and it sometimes becomes messy and challenging to be in this, in this broken group of people trying to follow Jesus. I think the author of Hebrews in chapter 10 has something to say about this reality. So here's what Hebrews 10, 19 to 25 says as Jesus invites us into what it means to regularly meet together. Here's what the author of Hebrews says. Therefore, Brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who was promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day approaching. That I don't think when he says neglecting to meet together, he is exclusively meeting Sunday morning gatherings because we've been missing that desperately. But the hope is despite the circumstances, the church keeps going forward. Why? I think the author of Hebrews is going to tell us why we continue to meet and why it's valuable to meet. And then he's going to give us three ideas of what it looks like when we meet together. So here's what he says. Therefore, therefore, because nothing is more important than what he's told us for 10 chapters. And we don't have time to look over those 10 chapters. But he's been telling us Jesus is better than anything else. And there's nothing more important than being forgiven and being embraced by God. And so he says this. Therefore, brothers. And he's going to give us two reasons why we build community. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus and by the new and living way that he opened up through us the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, did you catch the two reasons why he says we should meet together? He says that since Jesus has sacrificed himself, we ought to gather together. Because Jesus isn't inviting us into just something by ourselves on our own, but instead, Jesus purchased our eternal salvation, and as a result, we gather. We become this new family through his blood that does away with this kinship group as the primary identity. Instead, we are unified together. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Through his blood, we want to be together because of that radical, radical purchasing of our eternal life by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And then second, author of Hebrews says this. He says, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, that Jesus now has become our priest, that we don't go to the temple and we got to have a priest enter the Holy of Holies and make a sacrifice for us. Instead, we collectively, we as individuals, can go directly to our great high priest, that is Jesus. So why do we meet together? It's this idea that there is nothing, nothing Nothing more important than being forgiven and embraced by God and growing in our understanding and our experience and our ability to express God's love. And so the author of Hebrews now is going to give us three primary ideas of what it means to meet together. 
What do we do when we actually meet together? Here's what he says. Therefore, brothers, since we have this confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up through this curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, he gives us three let us statements. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And, not, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So what are we to do when we're building community? Because we build community in a variety of ways around here at Hillcrest, through women's ministry, through men's ministry. You heard Joe building community over a wild game feed, and you heard Aaron speak of a family night where we're playing bingo, building community organically over coffee and playdates and dinner. What does he say is the most important thing we should be doing? Because sometimes it feels like when we talk about not neglecting to meet, we speak exclusively to Sunday mornings. And when we think of spurring each other on to love and good works, we think of exclusively loving the poor or helping someone walk across the street who needs our help. But I actually think there's a priority of value that the author of Hebrews states these three ideas in. Here's how, we, here's how he speaks to what we're supposed to be doing. What are we to do when we meet together? The first thing he says let us wholeheartedly draw near to God. That the most loving thing we can do when we gather together, the thing that our soul craves, what we mean to do when we gather together is draw near to God, to be spurred on, to see our life reflected as, as our Father, to see our life seen in light of who He is and have that as our greatest perspective. What's the primary thing we can do when we gather together? It's to draw near to God. We do that by opening up his word. We do that through prayer. We do that through reflective questions about what the spirit of God is doing in someone's life. But we wanna draw near to God. The second thing he says when we get together, what are we to do when we meet together? He says, let us draw near, and then what? Second, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. I think he's saying let us tenaciously hold on to Jesus. Let us tenaciously uh, grab a hold of this promised salvation that we have. Do you feel like you've had to hold on lately to this? And sometimes feeling isolated and, and, and trying to desperately hold on to this promise of who Jesus is, and yet and yet maybe feeling disconnected in that. The author of Hebrews challenges us to link up with other people in our church family, other brothers and sisters, and hold fast to these promises of Jesus, to the confession of our hope that there is a life beyond this, and our, and our reconciliation, and our deepest confidence in this Jesus guy. That imagery of holding on, I, I'm feeling a little bit more fully during COVID. This need to meet together with other people in this church family as we hold fast tenaciously to Jesus. And then third, the third idea that he says that what we do when we meet together, he says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the day long. Let us stir one another up to good works. So I want to I want to I want to peer into what that community looks like the benefits of doing those three things together drawing to God inspired to hold on to Jesus and stirred up to love and good works encouraging each other in that process That church is more than just a singing and teaching event that happens once a week but it's actually the family of God gathering to anchor our lives in the most significant thing that our soul needs. And as much as we claim that those three things matter, 
even beyond COVID, it feels like there's still something in me that prevents me from moving in that direction of, of wanting to be inspired by others to draw near to God and hold fast to Jesus. It feels like there's things that prevent us from building community. That, that I look around, and even now as we're doing this over a video, I, I, I on some level know what I'm competing against. There's, a, there's, a, there's potentially a board game that could be clamoring for your attention. There's another Netflix show that you could click this off and move on. That it feels like there's an attraction for so much other stuff over meeting together and finding and pursuing someone else to be in this process with. That, that, we, that we have, we're inundated with so much other stuff that might attract us away from something we claim to believe. And, and so that prevents us from linking arms and meeting more fully with others. That, that you might say, You are less interested in jumping into a more intimate community because you've had a bad experience with that. Maybe if you've been disconnected from church for a while and you're checking out Hillcrest and there's still something in you that reflects back to a small group or another church, I think the church needs to own that we're not always so good in the messiness when, when someone's mess is presented, we're not always that good of embracing it. That what prevents us from meeting together is sometimes a bad experience that we have, either with church people or with a small group. Uh, I think we all are, are unique in, in how God has wired us. Sometimes that individualistic consumer mentality creeps in and, and it just feels like it's hard to find people with whom we connect. That, that we just don't feel like we click and that it doesn't work for me. I think what, what prevents us from meeting together is sometimes we just find it difficult for someone to encourage or inspire us. That we find it difficult to find people that, that might meet my needs. Again, I think back to this view of how we view church and what it's supposed to look like, what prevents us from sometimes jumping in to a community, because you're going to hear me promote life groups a little bit later, and jumping in a community, it feels like we find it difficult to find people with, with, uh, with characteristics that would encourage us or inspire us. Or we may believe that we've been following Jesus for a long time, and, and there's a fear that others might discover just how much I still have to grow in this journey. That I'm less likely to jump into a smaller setting because of just fear of what it might look like of someone discovering that I am so far uh, from, from the desired state of what I'd like to be. But here's my hope. What would motivate us to actually be together? Because this fall, we're going to try and launch more communities of being together in, and adjust to the circumstances we're in. What would propel us to want to jump into these communities? Actually believing ongoing spiritual transformation is something we desire and is needed for our life. That we actually believe the most important thing in our life is growing and embracing and experiencing this God more fully, this spiritual transformation that he's doing in our lives, that we actually believe and are anchored in that, and so we seek out communities to do that in. Whether organically or formally, we are seeking out people in this church family with whom we are inspired to pursue more of God together. That, that we actually understand the way God designed us to experience this, this transformation he's doing in our life, is actually through meeting together. That following Jesus isn't meant to be done alone, but actually we're invited into this community and the way we grow is actually by meeting together through the other knuckleheads that are my brothers and my sisters, pursuing one father. And, and it feels like taking a step back and just accepting where I am in this spiritual journey we again start building these hedges of how people might perceive and I may feel 
judged by where I am in this journey. Instead, an acceptance of where I am spiritually. Why? Because God accepts me exactly where I am in this spiritual journey. That why would I want to meet together with other people? Though I might not feel like I'm accepted for where I am, we accept where we are in this spiritual journey because God accepts us exactly where we are. Um, and, and it seems to me, sometimes, I begin building up in my head how a story is supposed to be and how a situation is supposed to go and, and how people are interacting around me. And I begin attributing motives to those around me. I think in the same way, what I would hope that would actually inspire us in a community is actually recognizing that those who appear to be ahead of us on this spiritual journey may not be, and even if they are, believing we all have room to grow. Because you're completely satisfied with where you're at in this spiritual journey. If you are, I would love you to shout through the screen and encourage me. Because till the day I die or Jesus returns, there's always another step in this ongoing spiritual journey. And then again, wherever I find myself in this journey, believe that God wants me to use where I am to encourage those around me. That I, I accept where I am in the spiritual journey, not too high, not too low of myself, and God is actually using me right where I am to encourage those around me as they pursue God. And then last, what would motivate us to jump into a life group this fall? What would motivate us to jump in a community this fall, socially distanced, trying to navigate that? What might inspire us? That we believe, we are convinced, we are confident there is no greater joy in life than growing in our understanding of and experiencing and then our ability to express the infinite love of God. And so I want to walk through five takeaways or five next steps that you might take wherever you find yourself on this journey. That I would want to challenge you. How are you drawing near to God? Not just Sunday at a singing and teaching event that, that hits us, but actually Monday to Saturday. The author of Hebrews in chapter 3 says this, Take care, brothers, lest there be any evil in you, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort each other every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened in the deceitfulness of sin. How are we drawing near to God? On Monday? On Tuesday? In this ongoing journey, how are we drawing near to God? that you've picked up a phone and you've reached out to someone just to challenge them and encourage them on their spiritual journey on that Monday morning. And then second, am I satisfied with what I'm doing to draw near to God? When you reflect on what that has looked like historically over COVID, are you satisfied? My hope is we can continue to grow and there's always a next step. And so, as you draw near to God, I, I would ask you, go back and reflect on Hebrews 10, 19, and, and why don't you read all the way to 31, and just ask this, God, will you reveal yourself to me as you, as you draw near to him? And we're about to hear a video of someone who's doing that in the context of community. So I want you to hear from Jane, one of the people around our church family that is going to share a little bit of her heart of what it means to participate in one of our life groups around here. Hello, Hillcrest. I'm Jane Mall, and I've been a member of Hillcrest for two years. I actually grew up in McFarland, was gone for almost 40 years, and moved back about three years ago, and it took me a year to find Hillcrest. Um, God led me here, and I knew that this is where I wanted to be um, plugged in. And that first fall, I signed up for a life group. All of my adult life, I've attended church and I've been in a small group or a home group, um, whatever you wanna call it. Here, we call it life groups, and I'm so glad that we do because we really do 
life together. When I signed up, I didn't know who was in the group, I didn't know who the leaders were, but I knew for Hillcrest to really feel like home to me um, that I needed to get plugged into a life group. Um, last year, I had an experience, my granddaughter, who was 16 months old at the time, had a really freak accident, and that experience really led um, me to experience life group being there for you. My granddaughter was um, at the end of a couch and she fell head first onto the floor, um, onto not this, but a little mixer kind of stand thing that looked like this but wasn't round. It had straight prongs. And the prong, one prong went right through her soft spot and into her brain. She ended up needing um, obviously emergency neurosurgery and it was touch and go for a while and my life group just rallied around me. They made the most delicious meal for the family. They put this huge care basket together um, with food for the two grandchildren that were at home that I was watching, toys for those kids, a journal for me, books for me, comfort things for all of us, um, delivered it to my house on an icy uh, Wisconsin winter. Um, the roads were terrible, but the, it got delivered. And of course, they prayed for Gwen every day and for the family. Before this public um, health emergency, you could walk in to Hillcrest on a Sunday morning and attend a service, and you could walk in and out and not really connect with anybody, not really know anybody. And I think now more than ever, we need to stay connected. Um, in small, intimate ways where we have fellowship and we can have accountability partners with one another. This summer, my group has stayed connected through Zoom meetings. We've done some social distancing um, gatherings in person as well. And I, I, asked, I asked the gals through text, what, what does this life group mean to you? I'll share a couple of responses. Um, one response was, the biggest reason I love this group is getting to share life daily with one another. The ups, the in-between, tough times, it's such an honor to have your friendship. Love and know you are praying there in the big and small. Celebrating and encouraging one another and how that helps has given iron to our lives. Obviously referring to iron sharpening iron. Knowing we are not alone and are so much better together, just sharing real life. Our life group and the beautiful array of backgrounds and experiences has also strengthened our faith, growing us into better disciples, challenging us to dig deeper into his word, study, learn, love his people better, and celebrate different talents and gifts in the group. It's such a beautiful picture of what I think heaven will look like one day. Thank you, Jane. To hear what she experienced as she drew near to God in the context of other people surrounding her, uh, encouraging her, motivating her to take hold of Jesus, to see these brothers and sisters, not as a fellowship at a potluck, but actually core people that we are linked to, that who is my mother and who are my brothers, but those that do the will of God. If you aren't in a life group this year, here's my encouragement. Reach out and sign up to get connected and we would love to help get you invested in a community that's doing three primary things. That we're experiencing life in the text. We're unpacking the biblical text and we're hearing and seeing and experiencing God through his word. And Jesus is calling us to do that, to meet together. And so we would love you to meet together with life in community. And then what we're gonna talk about next week what we also hope happens in Life Group is actually a desire to spur one another on to life on mission, to help others find their life with Jesus. So pray with me as we enter into worship and my encouragement, my strong encouragement, draw near to God and pursue one of these, uh, these, these contexts to be in community and meet with others as we draw near to God as we hold fast to the hope we have in Jesus and we spur one another on to good works. God, you're so good. What a gift to be back in person on Sunday mornings, but may we never see that as the exclusive understanding of the local church. That we desire to meet regularly far beyond the Sunday morning gathering but continue to exhort one another daily, Monday to Saturday, while it's today, and we look forward to the day of your coming. 
So continue to reveal yourself to us, be gracious to us, and help us find our satisfaction and significance in you above anything else this life has to offer. For your glory we pray. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love.
Amen. Well, thank you, worship team. Man, building community. Not a lot of topics that are closer to my heart than this idea of living life with others in close proximity in a way where they can see Jesus at work in you and you see Jesus at work in them. So powerful. Uh, so yeah, also um, on this topic of building community, uh, David, we, we are literally building our community in some new ways. Tell us about an exciting announcement that we have uh, this week in our community. Man, you heard from Tyler and Amanda last Sunday about their excitement about what it could look like to join our community. They have officially, and I shouldn't say they, Tyler has officially accepted our formal invitation to join our team this past week, and and he's going to be joining our church family, and they will become some of our brothers and sisters around the Hillcrest Church family in, in the coming months. So we cannot wait to hit the ground running and continue to pray for our student ministry community and what God is doing in the lives of our students as Tyler helps uh, helps students find life with Jesus mm-hmm. one life at a time. Amen. So uh, as you go with that news, go out into your lives and your communities, uh, into your neighborhood, among your families, and into the world to follow Jesus Monday through Saturday everywhere you go. All right. And we will look forward to seeing you next Sunday. But I cannot comprehend your ways, oh Lord, are too vast to understand. I seek to know you in my humanness, for you are more than I could ever fathom. You are more than I could ever grasp. Mystery.
I seek to know you.